Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Come and Reason Sabbath School class. Uh, my name is Lori Atkins. I am filling in for Dr. Jennings. He and Christy and Russell are still over in South Africa uh, performing some camp meetings and seminars. Um, we've heard from them again this week, still going really well, very warm reception. As he mentioned, uh, I think there were several years that they were trying to get us to come over and spread this message. So I think there was some pent-up demand. People were thirsty, and so they're really happy that they're there. He's, uh, Russell sent me some funny pictures of road signs and bathroom signs, as you would expect to get from Russell. And uh, he sent me some video of giraffes and African penguins, which I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently there are penguins that don't require Arctic cold or ice or anything, and they are waddling around Africa. So those are, those are cute. So I know that they're having a... What about the schedule? How, how, how long are uh, they are there, I think, through the end of this week. He's scheduled to be back here next Sabbath. So maybe jet lagged, but back. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, if you're here in class with us in College Dale, where it's finally fall, by the way, um, we have two new items out on the table for giveaway. We have some bumper stickers and some clear window stickers for your cars that can proclaim Come and Reason Ministries. So that's kind of cool. Grab some off the table. Give some to your friends. Stick them on your car. Um, also wanted to let you know, we do keep an email list here for the class locally. We use that list to communicate with you, to announce events or happenings. A lot of times we send out prayer requests that way. Um, one of the regular events... The third Sabbath of every month, we have a class potluck and a Bible study that typically goes over either that lesson from that day or the previous week's lessons, and it's kind of set up in a much more relaxed, laid-back format. There is a moderator, a facilitator, but there's no lecture like there is here. There are no cameras like there are here. Um, so it's a lot more interactive. There's a lot more opportunity for discussion and participation. In fact, it's a requirement. <laughs> so anyway, if you're interested in attending that, the next one is scheduled for November the 19th. Um, and like I said, you don't have to come to the potluck. You can still come to the Bible study or vice versa. Um, but if you'd like to be included in that or reminded about that, get with Francesca, who's in the room back here. Um, and make sure that we have your email address so that you're on the list to get notified. Okay, let's begin this morning's class with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are uh, anticipating your presence here with us today. We want you to come in, open our hearts, open our minds, take away distractions, and help us to focus on you, learn more about you. Um, we pray for our, our colleagues who are in another country spreading this message about you we pray for their safety for their um, clarity of their minds and we pray for the the people who are listening and hearing this message maybe for the first time that you would soften their hearts and open their minds and may, may they be receptive to the truth about your character we pray in jesus name amen so today we are studying lesson six in our quarterly about job the lesson's title is The Curse Causeless, which I found a strange title, but maybe it will become clearer as we get into the lesson. Um, this week's lesson stresses, again, the importance of putting ourselves not only in Job's position, it wants us to put ourselves in the position of Job's friends, who came to mourn, came to grieve with Job, and who here hasn't sought to comfort and console a friend or a loved one who's experiencing pain or loss? Who here has not needed comfort from their friends when they are experiencing their own time of pain and loss? And who here doesn't know what it's like to try to find the right words to speak when you've got somebody whose grief is cutting at your own heart as well? It's difficult, isn't it? To know what to say when there really isn't anything to say that's going to make anything better. It's tough to know what to do that will really help someone who is hurting. Uh, I think most of us tend to go with the casserole. <laughs> I don't know about you, but we tend to default 
to food <laughs> when it comes to grieving and loss. What would you have said to Job? What if you had a friend who had lost 10 children, all of his property, all of their animals, all his financial assets, and finally his health? Maybe it's better not to say anything. Yeah, one of the take home messages from Job that from his friends who didn't have a lot of good stuff to say, they were much better friends when they weren't saying anything. Absolutely. And to sit there for seven days, and I think it was Job who broke the silence, as I remember. Correct. It was. And we're, we're going to talk more about that, about the kind of the good and the bad that we can take from their example in providing comfort to a friend who, who's had a loss. Um, the last paragraph in Saturday's lesson reads, in fact, so much of the book of Job is taken up with the dialogue between Job and these men as they try to make sense of what so often seems to make no sense, colon, the endless parade of human suffering and tragedy in a world created by a loving, powerful, and caring God. So I'm not sure exactly what point they're trying to make here. Um, it sounds like they may be referencing some of the questions and issues that we addressed two weeks ago in lesson four that was titled God and Human Suffering. And whether a loving God is unwilling or unable or either or both to remove our pain and suffering. And if he did, what would that mean for us if we took that out to its ultimate end? And what would that say about God? This was an amazing and powerful class taught by Dr. Jennings, like I said, two weeks ago. And if you have not seen, you were not here, if you haven't seen it, I'm highly recommending that you go and view the archive. And we're going to talk just a little bit more about some of those, those points later in the lesson today, if we, if we get there. So we, we've read a quote in here from the Book of Education regarding the testing of Job. I've read it before, Russell read it, I'm going to read it again because it's so critical not just to the book of Job but to the foundation of the great controversy. And it says, unselfishness, the very principle of God's kingdom, is the principle that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy he has endeavored to prove that God's principles of action which is unselfish, beneficent, outward-moving love. He wants to prove those to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and of all who bear his name. And I mean, if you think about the position Satan was in, do you really think that he wanted to be proved wrong? He, when he's in the council of heaven, where, he's ask, where God's asking, have you considered my servant Job? Everybody's watching. He's got an opportunity here to cut into God's credibility. He honestly thinks that there's no way Job can be a loving, unselfish human being without being paid well or without some ulterior motive. Like I said, he doesn't want to be wrong. Do you really think he wanted to be wrong in the desert? when he's tempting Christ, he really didn't think that Jesus could act in an unselfish manner. He's tempting him on the cross to save himself. He really didn't think that that sort of unselfish love exists. And his whole mission has been to try to disprove it. The end of that quote is... Job's patient endurance, by his patient endurance, he vindicated his own character and thus the character of him whose representative he was. For those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, Bible biography has a yet higher lesson of the ministry of sorrow. Ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Witnesses that he is good and that goodness is supreme. So let's move to Sunday's lesson, where it talks about the big questions. This lesson, again, emphasizes the hugely important great controversy perspective that we have revealed for us in the book of Job. It gives us some 
some significant insight into this aspect of our reality that otherwise we wouldn't have had. Yes, Dr. Moses. I'm just going back to the question you just talked about, Satan. Just like selfishness changes our minds and makes us blind, yes. I think he's become blind. There's no question. It's a, it's a natural part of what alienation and selfishness has done to the mind. Yes, it's literally seared. You know, when Christ was talking to Nicodemus, he says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And we often think, oh, you can't go to heaven. Right. You can't see it. You can't even see it. You can't it. comprehend it. It's foreign. It's something that you cannot comprehend. Exactly. It's totally a different paradigm mm -hmm. that cannot be comprehended. Yeah, and we've talked in this class before. I mean, there's, if you refuse to believe truth, if you shut your mind to truth, there is only one thing left that you're going to believe and you're going to focus on, and it's a, it's a lie. And that's why they, they t it talks about the progression into darkness and depravity. That's the only thing left if you close your mind off to truth. And I've, he's the ultimate example of that, I think. So, like I said, this insight into the great controversy that we get into the book of Job kind of pulls back the veil where we see the, the council going on in heaven. It lets us know how closely connected our earthly world is with the supernatural world and this war that's going on around us. That a lot of times we forget. We're very self-focused. We see only what's going on in our, in our frame of vision. When, if we think about this fact that Satan is at work to malign the character of God and to prove that unselfish love doesn't exist, it's the motivation for everything going on around us. And it's, I don't know, it, it's hard to remember that that's going on all the time, but it's, I think it's critical for us to remember that that's going on all the time. So after the first two chapters of Job, we have a bunch of talking heads, a bunch of dialogue going on between Job, his three friends, and his wife. They're discussing the big questions. They're talking about the heavy issues of life, death, pain and suffering. Why do bad things happen to good people? Theology, philosophy, character of God. All these big issues. The lesson says, <clears throat> there is nothing like a calamity, either our own or that of others, to shake us out of our spiritual lethargy and get us to start asking the important questions. Any thoughts on this? Has anyone found this to be true in their own lives? Sometimes it's just a test. It reveals what you have already thought. Right. At times of crisis, I can't think clearly. Mm -hmm. So it's only what I have already stored up in me. Interesting. That is revealed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think that's true. Like you said, in the midst of the crisis, there's probably not a lot of clear thinking going on. But it can, it can hone our focus in, you know, on the things that really matter. Um, there are several Bible authors that seem to grasp this concept. They provided some advice about how to view tragedy and trials. I'll give you a couple of examples. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure, and genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. Rejoice greatly in this reality. Oh, this is the same text. That was the message. This is the same text in the remedy. Rejoice greatly in this reality, even though now for a little while you may suffer pain, grief, and trials of all kinds. These transient difficulties are allowed to come so that your confidence and trust in God, which is infinitely more valuable than gold, for even gold by fire will be destroyed, may be, may be permanently established in your character and result in praise, glory, and honor to God when Christ Jesus comes again. That was the remedy. There's a text in James 1, two through four. Consider it a pure gift or count it all joy, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. 
you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. James 1.12, anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. Psalm 119, 72 and 73, my troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Your teaching has taught me what is true and right. Any thoughts about this te these texts? Has the instruction to count trials and tragedy as joy, does that take a little work for you? Does it seem counterproductive? Uh, but who here has not experienced it, that refining fire? Who here has not had their faith strengthen, their capacity for love and compassion and empathy grown, their characters matured in ways that would not have happened and could not have happened if not for a trial. Isn't that true? These events, the ones that shake us out of our spiritual lethargy, can hone in our focus on the things that really matter. And I believe there are more of these events coming. Isn't this what we believe is going to happen at the beginning of the time of trouble? Events so significant so catastrophic that even the most inattentive are suddenly paying attention and asking questions. Don't we even see some of this today? I believe these trials will provide critical opportunities for every person alive to make a judgment about God, is he trustworthy, and a judgment about themselves, do they love others more than self? Or do they not love their lives so much as to shrink from death, as we're told in Revelation 12, 11. So One of the founders of our church refers to this as a shaking. Remember how many groups will there be at the end of time? Two. Only two. The Lord has faithful servants who, in the shaking, testing time, will be disclosed to view. There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you, but it may be under a rough and uninviting exterior the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime we look toward the heaven but do not see the stars. They are there, fixed in the firmament, but the eye cannot distinguish them. In the night, we behold their genuine luster. We have a question online. Uh, <clears throat> Luann asked, if you can ask Lori Wendell's comment, perhaps the voice of a friend, someone who comes alongside during a crisis is what directs our eyes to God above and the message that he wants to give at that moment. I don't see the question there. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I do think we play a role in that. And sometimes it's by saying nothing. I think we saw that exhibited in, in Job's friends. So more about this shaking. On every occasion that persecution takes place, the witnesses make decisions. Get your mind around that. On every occasion that persecution takes place, the witnesses make decisions either for Christ or against him. Those who show sympathy for the men wrongly condemned who are not bitter against them show their attachment for Christ. So, she, so Mrs. White says, let opposition arise. Let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. Hello, election season. <laughs> let persecution be kindled and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith, but the true Christian will stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter than in days of prosperity. The broken ranks, 
because she says many will leave the church during this, this shaking. But those broken ranks will be filled up by those represented by Christ as coming in at the 11th hour. Remember the parable, the wedding feast, and there were people coming in at the 11th hour. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who now have no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the very first time. Now that language, the time of God's destructive judgments, that's dark language. What do we think she means here? Are these, do we consider these God's destructive judgments? No, I just think that's what happens with design. When he pulls back, then, yes. you know, when the winds of strife are released. And also, you have to really, if you have a good relationship with God, you really have to trust him in the outcome, which is your faith. That's right. And yeah, I, I think it, it comes down to, as I am finding, everything comes down to what law lens are you looking through? What law lens are you interpreting this language, whether it's scripture, whether it's inspired writings? What law lens are you looking through? It's a linchpin, it's a turnkey that is, it affects everything. And like she said, these are not destructive judgments. These are the natural results of God finding fewer and fewer places to dwell. He dwells in us. And as more and more people close their minds, sear their conscience, and tell God, I don't want you here, there's less place for him to be, and so there's less of his presence. And as he pulls away, Satan's power becomes more manifest. We're being protected. We're in a, a bubble, a, you know, artificially protected from the destructive power of sin, and we have been for a long time. Um, anyway, I also think this is merciful. God is... His sole goal is to save as many people as possible. And he knows that unless people are faced with something big enough, catastrophic enough to catch their attention because they're busy with the mundane things of life and working and paying bills and rarely lift their eyes, if they're not faced with this decision about whether God is trustworthy and what will they do, will they give their life so someone else can live or will they take a life, that's how, they're, that's how they're saved, that's how they're healed, and time is short. So without those decision-making opportunities, I don't see those as destructive judgments, I'd see them as merciful. She also says, soon the last test is to come to all inhabitants of the earth. At that time, prompt decisions will be made. Those who have been convicted under the presentation of the word will range themselves under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. The pink box at the bottom of Sunday's lesson says, have you been able to look back at former trials and seen the good that has come out of them? How many of us have been able to look back and see very positive things that while we were in the midst of it were, you could not imagine that something positive could, could come out of it. It also says, How do you deal with those trials that have brought nothing good? Any thoughts on that? You try to um, think of God looks at the big picture. So if you don't see it and you trust him, then in the end, you probably will be ahead somehow. I totally agree. My question was, do those exist? Yeah. My Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. In the remedy it says, and we know that in all things, at all times, in all circumstances, God works for the good of his creation and for the good of all who love him. Those who have accepted God's call to work with him according to his purpose experience the good things that God has for them. Yeah. So are there really some tragedies and trials that have brought nothing good and if that is our perspective, are there things we can do 
to change that scenario. I might add the word yet. Yes. Yet. That, you know, hang in there, stay with <laughs> sit with the person who felt like this is one of those, you know, all those things, sure, sure, but this one, no, there's nothing good. And I would, in, maybe whether I said it out loud or not, it would be basically in the back of my mind to remember, not yet. Yes. I can't see it. Donna. And also, the good may be what it's hopefully doing to my character. Correct. So if I'm not receiving anything good, I have to look and see, well, is God going to have to put me through something again? Because I'm not learning. Because I haven't learned yes. through this experience. That's exactly right. And sometimes it's a change of perspective. And I think, Karen, to your point, I think many times it's very harmful to try to convince someone immediately that there's good going to come out of something that appears to be horrific and awful. So for me, it's usually, it's, I call it a tapestry. He is weaving, or I call it a symphony, and he's a maestro. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes that doesn't come together. Sometimes it doesn't come together in our lifetime. We may never see the impact that something bad that happened to us might have had on somebody else, or our testimony had. So yet is, is a big word for that. And I call it not signing God's signature to something real time. I mean, right. rarely a time when you can really see God's hand working with certainty real time. Real time. It takes a lot of that weaving and the wovenness of uh, the, the intricacies of life looking back. That yeah. You can see the string and that strain that was being wrought. And I, I think it takes a change in our perspective. I think it takes us being in tune and operating on the same wavelength as he does in order to see, look back and see things the way he saw them. So let's look at Monday's lesson. The title is, When Have the Innocent Perished? And as we saw in the title of this lesson, the underlying thought is that we never experience a curse without a cause. That if something bad happened, you probably deserved it. In science, we call that uh, association does not necessitate causation. That's right. So I would counter that by, by challenging them to say that just because something happened doesn't mean that there is a... Uh, a direct cause. A direct cause. Yeah. I told, uh, there's, there's huge flaws in those philosophies we're going to talk about. Um, so Job 2, 11 through 13 gives a little description of how Job's friends viewed his situation. It says, now when Job's three friends heard all of this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. They all lived in different places. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. This is good stuff. They made an appointment. They planned to come together to comfort their friend, and they were obviously stunned by what they saw, because Job was unrecognizable. Then they sat silently with him for seven days, never saying a word. This practice likely originated with the Jewish mourning ritual called sitting Shiva. You ever heard of that? That's seven days of empathy and compassion marked by mourners sitting on either low stools or on the ground. That's the sitting part. Shiva is the Hebrew word, I think, for seven. Um, the first instance mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 7.10 where it says, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. This is after Noah, his family, all the animals were in the ark. And the rabbis of the Talmud say that these seven days were a period of mourning for Methuselah, the oldest man on the earth who had just died. So thanks, Google, for that little tangent. <laughs> but that was likely the... The practice that they were, that they were uh, doing for seven days, sat silently, comforting Job, mourning with him. But then once Job spoke, as Karen mentioned, Job spoke first. 
and was kind of listing his complaints. Then we find out that these friends actually had plenty to say. Eliphaz's initial response is found in Job 1 through 11. Then Eliphaz, the Teman, spoke up. Would you mind if I said something to you? Under the circumstances, it's hard to keep quiet. You yourself have done this plenty of times, spoken words that clarify, encourage those who were about to quit. Your words have put stumbling people back on their feet, put fresh hope in the people about to collapse. But now you're the one in trouble. You are hurting. You've been hit hard, and you're reeling from the blow. But shouldn't your devout life give you confidence now? Shouldn't your exemplary life give you hope? Think, has a truly innocent person ever ended up on the scrap heap? Do genuinely upright people ever lose out in the end? It's my observation that those who plow evil and sow trouble reap evil and trouble. One breath from God and they fall apart. One blast of his anger and there's nothing left of them. The mighty lion, king of the beasts, roars mightily, but when he's toothless, he's useless. No teeth, no prey. And the cubs wander off to fend for themselves. What version is that? That's the message. So the quarterly states, if you were writing a book on grief counseling, you could use the friend's initial response in the chapter called How to Help a Grieving Soul. And then you could feature Eliphaz's response in the chapter titled What Not to Do or Not to Say to Help a Grieving Soul. The lesson says it's hard to imagine someone coming up to a person going through all that Job was going through and saying basically, well, you must have deserved it because God is just and only the wicked suffer like this. (laughs) Is that so hard to imagine? Sadly, no. It happens all the time in church. Well, this is very common thought. It is. History, it's throughout the Bible, you know. I mean, who said uh, this that this man was born blind? Or this man, you know. I, and believers and non believers alike share this perspective. We're going to talk more about that. So Eliphaz is spouting straight retribution theology here. Lots of folks still believe that if bad stuff happens to you, then you must have done something wrong. And if a bunch of bad stuff happens to you, like has happened to Job, then you must have done something really wrong. (laughs) But don't forget, many of these same folks also believe that if you do everything right, and you check off all of the behavior boxes, then prosperity will follow. But see, we even have this currently in the sound of music. Yes. I must have done something good. You know, the little song that yes. whatever her name was that, you know, sings, you know? And we, we still believe you have that. Totally. The other side of the retributive justice coin is the prosperity gospel. And in my experience, both of these philosophies are severely flawed. The pink box at the bottom of Monday's lesson, think about a time people comforted you amid loss and pain. What did they say? How did they say it? And what did you learn from that experience that could help you when you are in the position of having to comfort someone else? Did you think about that? Have you ever had a situation where somebody actually came and comforted you and it was meaningful and it was helpful? Yes? I think one of the worst things we can say to someone because of arbitrary God perceptions is the phrase God is in control. Yes. To an atheist or a Christian that believes God is arbitrary, to say that God is in control is to say, well, God chose this to happen to you. And that was his choice, so you should just accept it. Yes. And especially to an atheist, they're going to say, well, gosh, your God is a jerk. Exactly. Or it was God's will. It must have been God's will. God is sovereign. I mean, we have all sorts of phrases to express the same horrific thing about God. 
that's what we're doing is we're maligning his character when we when we say things like that. Not to mention not helping the person. I don't think there's any malintent. Right. I totally agree. We have to consider our way of maybe balancing that out without uh, spurning the person who is in. I think that's why we do what we do. We're trying to figure yes. out, connect the dots in a way that is so painful that we, like uh, uh, Wendell says that we'll be ready because we won't be able to think clearly at the that time. You, in, in the ER, you, you review A, B, C, D, E, A, A, B, C, D, E. You go through everything so where when it, the time happens, it comes out like it's, just it's, it's a reflex. Yes. So I think that's why we work here, not so that we're superior, but that so that we can truly work with the reality of what is yes. when the situation oh, comes, well including said. the people who in well, well intent say things that really put God in a poor light. I think that's well said. And I mean, it's, that's the reason for all training, police, fire, military. It's so that in the moment when you know you don't have nearly as clear thinking or the time, it becomes a reflex. Yes, exactly. Google. <laughs> exactly. But I think, I don't know, sometimes I think it's our inability. I don't know that we could do what Job's friends did and sit silently for seven days. Most of us cannot stand the discomfort or the awkwardness and have to say something, even if it's damaging, even if it's not helpful. In my life, my friends have come and we've got done stuff. We've walked and we might not say anything. We've walked, yes. hiked, been in beauty. But remember, he was covered with boils. Exactly. He was, I mean, for him to move was incredibly was painful. So they went to the place that would create as much comfort for him. Yes. And at that time, it was probably just being still. Absolutely. No, I think that's important. Let's see. Let's look at Tuesday's lesson. A man and his maker. So, oh, I was also going to say, the lesson does state several times it guards against we're very quick to judge, and so in that line, we're also very quick to judge Job's friends at what they said poorly or how they said it or we would never do that. But just as we're putting ourselves in Job's position and thinking what would we do if we were tested and considered and watched by the universe, what would we do if we were Job's friends? Would we actually provide any better feedback than they did? And that's what Karen was talking about, how we we train or we practice or we study in advance of being needed in that situation. So Eliphaz, I think we confirmed, not in the running for the best sympathy or the most tact award. But did you notice that he used a common personnel management technique when he was responding to Job's complaints? You know about this, right? When managers are required to give their employees constructive criticism or feedback, um, a lot of times they camouflage that criticism between compliments. So they'll give them something positive and they'll give them something constructive and then they'll wrap it up with something positive. So Eliphaz gives Job props for his past ability to be an encouragement, to be a counselor for others, at least when things were going well for Job. But his tone changes pretty quickly in verse 5, and it kind of spirals down from there. And he also seems to read into and respond to a lot of things that Job never actually said. Job, Job's response was basically just to run down a list of his complaints, a list of the things that had happened to him. But Eliphaz responds to a lot more than that. He said that God is just, and so the evil that comes upon us is deserved... This belief is still shared by many Christians and non-Christians alike. Isn't this the underlying thread of karma in the Eastern religions? It's even an underlying thread in the natural law we study of sowing and reaping. How is it different from those? That's not the only reason that bad things happen. Yes. Just what we talked about with Karen. There's not necessarily a direct causal effect. So one of the differences is found back in our study from lesson four two weeks ago. 
In that lesson, I again encourage you to watch the recording. Read the notes, too, if you haven't. We talked about some of the many reasons why suffering, pain, and death occur on this earth that have no direct causal relationship to what someone has sowed. Entropy. This is the slow, gradual decay of order that occurs because we're disconnected from God's constant, full presence and care. Aging and this first death, sleep, occurs because of entropy, because of this slow decay. Nobody has to do anything. I'm telling you, I'm not sowing this, <laughs> but I'm reaping it. <laughs> and there's nothing, if there were something else I could plant <laughs> that would let me reap something else, I would be on it. But I've got, I mean, I've got no alternative. Or the alternative is bad. <laughs> Genetic defects and disease because of entropy, the slow decay of our original design. This happens without anybody needing to cause it. There are toxic, toxins and poisons in our environment today because of mutations and alterations to God's design. These changes in nature and the manufacture of chemicals and products that were not present in God's original creation. <laughs> There are evil and selfish actions originating in people who are selfish. Abel didn't do anything to cause himself to be murdered by Cain. That was not sowing and reaping. There are evil and selfish actions inspired by Satan upon people that end up hurting others. Judas betraying Christ. It says he was, he was overtaken or Satan took him over. Satan and his agencies are themselves affecting nature and causing problems, as we see in the first chapter of Job. There are good people acting to defend and protect that can still cause pain, tragedy for others. Good people acting selfishly and doing bad things. David murdering Uriah. This occurs because sin in the heart, there is still sin in the heart that's not yet removed. People, whether good or evil, just make mistakes. Car accidents, slip and fall on the ice. There are humans acting on God's orders. We have a number of examples in the Old Testament where God's people acting on God's orders still caused tragedy and pain for others. In some places, God acts to protect, lance, or cauterize to keep open the way of the Messiah, putting people in the grave, putting people to sleep in the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the platoons that came to arrest Elijah, the firstborn of Egypt. There's a number of examples of, of God actually working in mercy to protect, but still causing pain and sorrow and, and tragedy for many people. So the quarterly says it's fascinating, and we talked about this even with Job. Job and his friends, they, how they understood the nature and character of the true God. When we think about the time in which this was happening, right after the flood, right after the Tower of Babel, before the beginnings of the nations of Israel, before Moses had written the Torah or his books, but they still, they were obviously meticulous writers. I mean, I would think someone had to be writing this stuff down, even if Moses had not compiled it into books. And they were also had to be really good historians and good at passing these stories down from one generation to the next. Because they clearly had a very defined picture of the character of God. Obviously, Job's friends' picture was different than Job's, but they were, they were convicted and knew something about the Lord. Wednesday's lesson. <clears throat> Can I ask you something about Job? Yes. The second half of, of chapter four, mm -hmm. um, it talks about a vision in the night. Yeah. The vision in the night comes from someone who speaks softly, so, oh, God speaks softly, it must be from God. And yet you listen to what he says, that's the voice of the devil. Yes. 
because he's accusing, he's stating, when does, I mean, God even accuses his angels. Well, who is the angel that was being accused of anything? Right. You know, this is all from the devil, and yet we quote it as being scripture and being correct. That's right. And we repeat it, and it's not. I thought the same thing. I mean, again, even the response in this vision had nothing to do with jo what Job said. This was responding to reading something into, because my guess is the devil wanted it said, but it was not responding to anything Job had, had claimed. And the accusation he made about God is the same one he's always been making about God. He presented a satanic view of God, in my opinion. He did. And, and, and yet we repeat it and, and quote it in our scripture. Right. Or and like you said, just can Satan not give dreams? I'm pretty sure that's within his realm of possibility. Um, yeah, I skipped over the... Sorry. I skipped over the, the dream thing, again, because it was, it's mentioned as some divine insight, and I'm not at all sure that it was. Mm -hmm. Wednesday's lesson is titled, The Foolish Taking Root. This was a strange one for me. As far as I can tell, the crux of Wednesday's lesson is saying that Eliphaz is not entirely wrong in his theology, and in what he is saying, that evil happens only to evil people. And then they offer several, more than several, Bible text examples that supposedly echo those same thoughts. Did anybody look at those texts to see if, uh, did you find any consistency, Wendell? Well, um, my response was on Thursday's first sentence, which is a response to Wednesday, mm -hmm. which... Um, you know, valid points, points that we found expressed later in the Bible. And my, my response is, is, is just because it's in the Bible a sign that it's true or best? If you right. go back to Christ's statement, God gave you divorce because you, of your wicked hearts. Yeah. You know, things happen because of wickedness, not because it's, it's true. And there, there is bad things. If you read Psalms 137, it talks about smashing babies against the rock. Right. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's good. Exactly. You know, and I think a lot of these, these statements are, if you read the whole text, yes, search me and, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Right. But in the middle of that, some statements are made that are not <laughs> correct. Yeah. And to me, that's just, that last statement is an acknowledgement that I know I've still got some stuff that needs to be cleaned up. So, and I, I still... Again, I come back to the law lens. What law lens are you looking through? And what law lens are you reading these texts through? And for me, it was, a, it was a stretch to even find a correlation in many of these texts. I'll read a couple of them. Um, I, I didn't feel like there was much consistency with these texts and what Eliphaz was, was promoting. The first one is Psalm 37. <clears throat> 10 and 11. A lot of times I took either a verse before or a verse after just to get a little context. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I know, I see some furrowed brows. Proverbs 26.2 Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. And it sounds like this is where the title of the lesson came from. So just like a bird that flits around, it seems to say if the curse is not deserved, then it's not going to end up staying. Yes? It's still flitting around. I know. <laughs> exactly. And did it, did it not flit on Job? Did it stay? Yes? I've recently had some evil influence in my life and I was discussing this with somebody yesterday that even though the evil was flitting around it still has not affected me in a serious way as long as I deal with it emotionally properly you know I could um, look at it as overwhelming right but if I actually reason it out I can see that it could have been much worse 
but there was, I can see God's hand saying, this is as close as you come. But evil is always around us, even when we're comfortable. That's the text that wasn't included in this list, is in this world you will have trouble. He promises us, he's speaking to believers there. That's a promise, not that everything's gonna be hunky-dory. More of these, Luke 152, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Again, I struggle with any correlation there. Psalm 34, six, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. I don't know if, there's, if they're intimating there that the Lord did not save Job out of his troubles when he called. It sounded to me like he did. Hebrews 12.5, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Was what happened to Job the Lord's discipline? Based on what we know was... To support, they decided that what I said was correct. So they're calling scripture to find scripture that supports what he says. That's kind of spooky. Mm-hmm. And poorly done, in my opinion. Um, again, I think what we know about what happened behind the scenes, we would say this was not the Lord's discipline. But we also know that even Job, in his mature character state still had more growing to do. We know, again, that he was sacrificing to the Lord on his children's behalf in case they had done anything wrong to hopefully try to assuage. So there was still some things about God's character that need to be revealed, and they were through this struggle. So, I don't know. I could stretch and say that that's the Lord's discipline. He's discipling. He's teaching. He's always wanting to move us, grow us, mature us in character. And he did that, but the the baseline or the origination of this, I don't believe, was God's discipline. This was all Satan. Hosea 6.1, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Did the Lord tear Job to pieces? No. And he didn't even dictate to Satan what his actions had to be. Satan had the opportunity to bless Job. The, um, the heading, is, obviously this is part of the, uh, the translator's notes, but the heading in my Bible to, uh, for Hosea 6 is the people's insincere repentance. So if you read through the whole chapter, it's not about devout repentance. It's about a people's insincere response to trouble that comes. Right. And... They very likely felt like the Lord had torn them to pieces. Again, it comes from a different worldview, a different view of what God's character and law is about. Yes. Whether this is an arbitrary God enacting things. Yes. Jane. Well, it's almost with these verses as though um, <clears throat> these things happen. It's, it's kind of like saying, the Lord said it, therefore I believe it. That settles it. And, and that settles it. We... We can't reserve the right to question, or we shouldn't reserve the right to question something and to evaluate it right. and to challenge it. it. It's a very liberal thinking that you accept the results, you don't challenge it. We've heard those statements in the last few days. Right. right. So. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And even Job, I would say even in, in Job's response, Again, I think this was part of his growing and maturing and maybe a distortion he had about the character of God. He was not refuting necessarily this retribution theology. He was refuting the fact that he hadn't done anything. You know what I mean? So he was saying, I didn't do anything bad in order for this bad stuff to happen, which to me says, if I had done something bad, then I could understand this because this is the way God works. So I think he was also being taught that about the character of God. Yes, Teresa. Wasn't this whole controversy 
placed here on earth to show what it would be like for someone like Satan to rule? Yes. So if Satan is the ruler of this earth, I don't want to put it like that, God is the ultimate, mm -hmm. then God, Jesus, has to step back and let him do so. I think the whole situation is we need to be grateful yes. that God is still here with us. And if we ask him, if we believe in him, if we trust him, he is by our side. Yes. So ultimately, Job went through whatever Satan wanted to put him through. That's right. I think that's well said. And like we said, we are being artificially sustained and have been for thousands of years. We have to trust God. We have to trust Him. And that's what we were talking about with the time of trouble. That's just going to be an inkling when God steps back and allows Satan and sin to take its natural course, which it hasn't been allowed to take, thank God. But that's, that's when we get a preview of it, and Job got a preview of it. Not to say a whole lot, but I'll just put it this way. I know of a young teenager at one point who went through some tremendously horrible things at home. Yeah. And I know for a fact that God came to her and told her that people have choice. But I was beside of your side and I cried with you the whole time. That's right. It's where Satan reigns. Yes. We are here to show the rest of the universe that if we believe in God, he will pull us through. This is what it's like to let Satan reign. That's right. And this is what it's like when God's methods and principles are employed. There's healing that takes place. There's transformation that takes place. There's restoration that takes place. It's the only thing that can do it. So just as Satan is hell-bent, sorry, on stating that unselfish love doesn't exist, our work is to prove that it does. And the only way we have the chance to prove that is to allow the transformation and the healing to take place. That's my only capability of performing an unselfish act is if God has come in and changed my selfish heart, taken it out and, and replaced it with one that's, that's unselfish. Yes, Peggy. Uh, this is from Autumn. For years and years we have confused discipline with punishment, but John cleared that up for us by telling us that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. If God is love, then he can't punish for that would generate fear. So while God disciplines, sometimes unpleasantly, he does not punish. I have no nothing to add to that. That's really well said. Thank you, whoever made that comment. Um, oh, we are up against it on time. Um, Thursday's lesson, Rush to Judgment. As we talked about, we're so quick to judge and so quick to think that we know what we would do if we were in someone else's situation. And as I continue to mature, or entropy continues to have its effect on me, I think if we think we know what we would do in somebody else's situation, then we just have not lived enough. We need to get out more, because the more I learn, <laughs> I, I'm in no position to judge what anybody does in any situation. And this is talking about sitting in judgment of Job's friends. And we're, we're going to talk about his other two friends in the next couple of weeks. And, and his wife. None of them were... Supportive. They're not winning any awards in the, in the empathy department. Um, let's see. There's a quote, there was a quote on Thursday or Friday's lesson illustrating what some people might say, again, with no malintent, but really hurtful, injurious things that people have heard within the doors of a church. And there's a quote in the, in the Ministry of Healing, page 163, that says, many think that they are representing the justice of God while they wholly fail of representing his tenderness and his great love. Often the ones whom they meet with sternness and severity are under the stress of temptation. Satan is wrestling with these souls, and harsh, unsympathetic words discourage them and cause them to fall prey to the tempter's power. So I think that's something we can think about when we're thinking about what words to use when we come across somebody that's 
struggling or in pain. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, speak. <laughs> David. This last week uh, we were down helping St. Augustine mm -hmm. with people's homes that were destroyed. Yes. And it kind of helps summarize what you're talking about. Service helps keep us relevant. Yes. Um, when you're helping people, sometimes the best thing you can do is just hug them and help them. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how it brings healing on both parts. Um, totally agree. And I wasn't totally joking about the casserole. I mean, there are temporal needs. There are things in life that have to go on that kind of get dropped in periods of crisis or grief. Or, so, I mean, it's, it's a real ministry to help with those temporal needs. We see that example in Christ. Thanks very much for your participation today. We'll see you back here next week. Let's close with prayer. Father God, we are grateful for your presence here today. We're grateful that we get to learn more about you, and the more we learn, we more we find out that you are nothing like Satan portrays you to be. Father, continue to bless this ministry, bless this class, um, and bring us back here safely next week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.